a reading from the book of Genesis. Judah approached Joseph and said, I beg you, my Lord, let your servant speak earnestly to my Lord, and do not become angry with your servant, for you are the equal of Pharaoh. My Lord asked your servants, have you a father or another brother? So he said to my Lord, we have an aged father and a young brother, the child of his old age. This one's full brother is dead, and since he is the only one by that mother who is left, his father dotes on him. Then you told your servants, bring him down to me that my eyes may look on him. Unless your youngest brother comes back with you, you shall not come into my presence again. When we returned to your servant, our father, we reported to him the words of my Lord. Later, our father told us to come back and buy some food for the family. So we reminded him, we cannot go down there. Only if our youngest brother is with us can we go. For we may not see the man if our youngest brother is not with us. Then your servant, our father, said to us, As you know, my wife bore me two sons. One of them, however, disappeared. And I had to conclude that he must have been torn to pieces by wild beasts. I have not seen him since. If you now take this one away from me too, and some disaster befalls him, you will send my white head down to the netherworld in grief. Joseph could no longer control himself in the presence of all his attendants, so he cried out, Have everyone withdraw from me. Thus, no one else was about when he made himself known to his brothers. But his sobs were so loud that the Egyptians heard him, and so the news reached Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still in good health? But his brothers could give him no answer. So dumbfounded were they at him. Come closer to me, he told his brothers. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you once sold into Egypt. But now do not be distressed, and do not reproach yourselves for having sold me here. It was really for the sake of saving lives that God sent me here ahead of you. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Remember the marvels the Lord has done. When the Lord called down a famine on the land and ruined the crop that sustained them, he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They had weighed him down with fetters, and he was bound with chains till his prediction came to pass, and the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the peoples set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions. Domino 
Dios fobisco. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundo Matteo. Jesus said to his apostles, As you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. Do not take gold or silver or copper for your belts, no sack for the journey, or a second tunic, or sandals, or walking stick. The laborer deserves his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, look for a worthy person in it and stay there until you leave. As you enter a house, wish it peace. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If not, let your peace return to you. Whoever will not receive you or listen to your words, go outside that house or town and shake the dust from your feet. Amen, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Ad bom do ordmini. Today's liturgical readings for this Thursday of the 14th week in Ordinary Time seem to revolve around three themes, and I'm going to focus just on one of them, but the three themes are this, the healing results of forgiveness and reconciliation, the healing results or the healing effects of forgiveness and reconciliation when one forgives and when one reconciles. Number two, the fact that God never permits an evil, a moral evil or a physical evil, without bringing some greater good out of it. We know that God is never the cause of evil. He can't be. But in his mysterious providence of letting things work according to their natures and adding into the mix the fall of our first parents, the original sin, we are in a broken, wounded world where there are physical and moral evils. Physical evils like natural disasters. Moral evils like vices that if not gotten rid of can ruin a person's life. But he never permits an evil, moral or physical, without bringing some greater good out of it. And thirdly, the third theme, the duty we have to listen to the word of God and evangelize it. The healing results of forgiveness and reconciliation, the fact that God never permits an evil, moral or physical, without bringing some greater good out of it, and the duty we have to listen to the word of God and evangelize it. And I want to focus on the first of these three, the healing results of forgiveness and reconciliation. Before I get into that, I want to just kind of recap these last few days about faith and having no obstacles to our faith, faith which is both a gift of God and a human act in response to God for such a great gift, and how we're bold toward our faith in defending it and proclaiming it and not letting obstacles get in our way. And I use St. Maria Goretti and St. Joseph these last two days as part of a thematic uh, six homily series this week, Monday through Saturday of this 14th week of Ordinary Time, while I'm here filling in for the friars, to show how their lives lead to a life of virtue, St. Maria Goretti and St. Joseph, with their strong faith. Maria against her attacker, Joseph as the foster father of the guardian of the Redeemer, and not letting obstacles get in his way and being very bold as a protector, a defender, of, of his bride, the Blessed Virgin, of his child, and of virtue. It's interesting that 
Alessandro Serenelli had the vision of Maria in prison giving him 14 white lilies, right? Uh, one for each stab wound. And St. Joseph with the staff, how always has the staff depicted with what at its top? Sprouting the white lily, right? So I want to talk a little bit about purity and modesty. They go hand in hand. Matthew 5, 8, the Sermon on the Mount says, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure of heart, they shall see God. St. Peter Julian Amar, the great uh, defender and promoter of Eucharistic adoration, he says, we must be pure. I do not speak merely of the purity of the five senses. No, we must observe great purity in our wills, in our intentions, and in all of our daily actions. De deportment, you know, how we act across the board, right? St. Lucy says, those whose hearts are pure are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Those whose hearts are pure are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And St. Alphonsus Liguori, the founder of the Redemptorist Order, great doctor of the church, he says, we must practice modesty, not only in our looks, but also in our whole deportment, and particularly in our dress, our walk, our conversation, and all other similar actions carried out throughout the day. We have a duty to protect not only the virtue of ourselves, but also to protect the virtue of others. A true Christian wants to protect not only their own virtue, but the virtue of, hence, thus, how we act, how we dress, how we handle our total deportment, conversation, walk, again, to quote the areas of St. Alphonsus Liguori. So just beautiful, beautiful uh, saints quotes and scriptural quotes on purity and modesty. St. Augustine, who suffered a lust addiction, we know that from his confessions, he says, chastity or cleanness or purity of heart holds a glorious and distinguished place among all the virtues because she alone, purity, enables man to see God. Hence, truth itself said, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. He's re-quoting scripture, which I just began with from the Sermon on the Mount. And St. Bede the Venerable says, He alone loves the Creator perfectly, who manifests a pure love for his neighbor. A pure love for his neighbor, and not a utilitarian type of acquaintance, okay, where where you simply are friends with a person because you use them for things, the, the sin of utility, the sin of utilitarianism, as opposed to uh, true disinterested love. Now, we hear the word disinterested in, in our English today, our modern English, it sounds almost negative, but when it comes to love and true friendship, disinterested love, disinterested friendship is really the highest form. In other words, I'm friends with you not for any utilitarian purpose, but I'm friends with you simply because I wish to be friends with you. I'm not utilitarian towards you, you're not utilitarian towards me, and I know that, because some people are very utilitarian. They wanna come off as your acquaintance, your friend, but they're very utilitarian. Now a little bit about modesty, which is kind of the handmaiden of purity. Modesty is the virtue that safeguards the dignity of a person and their association with others, St. Thomas Aquinas says. Now, we already know that we are called to protect not only our own virtue, but the virtue of others. And modesty is the virtue that safeguards the dignity of a person in their association with others. Now we can see why modesty and purity go hand in hand. Modesty benefits both the individual and society, that is, the other, because it governs the exterior appearance and behavior of the person and thus helps make society civil and harmonious by helping to protect the virtue in the other person. Beyond dress or clothing, the virtue of modesty is also concerned with such things as manner of speech, posture, gestures, and the general presentation of the overall person. 
The virtue of modesty calls upon all people to behave well with others and conform to standards of decency and decorum found in the healthy customs of an ordered, moral, and just society. You know, right now, there's so much crime in our American society. Just this last weekend, for the 4th of July, two cities reported the highest ever crime rate for a 4th of July weekend, three-day weekend, ever. Talk about the need for modesty and purity and our own self kept in check virtuously, precisely to care about the virtue of the other, huh? So when you present yourself properly to others, you are being modest. When you control yourself in your external actions, including such things as speech, not just dress, but total deportment, when you control yourself in your external actions and manners in society, you are modest. But when you act erratically and speak in a manner that offends and disregards others, you are immodest. Now, boundaries are good. Boundaries need to be established. We're going to talk about that a little more when I talk about forgiveness and the healing effects of forgiveness and reconciliation. But a little bit on modesty and and purity, precisely because we want our faith to lead us with no obstacles into a virtuous life. We look at St. Maria Goretti in our own modern 20th century, last, and St. Joseph as two great examples of purity and modesty, both have the white lily strongly associated with them in their depictions in sacred art. So having talked about St. Joseph and St. Maria Goretti, it's, it's good to talk about what the church teaches in general about purity and modesty. And the, the best thing, the most important thing I want you to take from that, everything I just said, is that we're called not only to lead ourselves into virtue, but to care about the virtuous growth of the other, of others, yes, of the other. I want to lead others into virtue by my total deportment, huh? Now, the healing results of forgiveness and reconciliation. We see that in the first reading from Genesis, even Joseph tells his brothers, after they all realize it's him, he says, don't reproach yourselves for having sold me into slavery because I can see now that it was for the evangelization of the people that God sent me here through you. In other words, God brought a great good out of evil, right? That's one example of that. But in that God brings a greater good out of evil, which I said earlier, whether physical or moral, we can also see such things as a, a prior break in a relationship being healed through reconciliation. Very, very important. St. Augustine says, There are many kinds of alms, the giving of which helps us to obtain pardon for our sins, but none is greater than that by which we forgive from our heart a sin that someone has committed against us. St. Teresa of Avila, The saints rejoiced at injuries and persecutions because then in forgiving those things, They had something to present to God when they prayed to him. How about that? The saints embraced the persecutions, the tribulations, whatever it was, including maybe fallouts with people, because then in forgiving those injustices, they precisely had something to present to God in prayer. Again, bringing a good out of an evil, right? St. Ambrose, the confessor of St. Saint Augustine, says, no one ever heals himself by wounding another. St. Jean-Marie Vainy says something similar. No one ever heals himself by wounding another. And Pope St. John Paul II says, the giving of oneself brings with it an enriching of oneself. I think I've quoted that one in the past. And St. Catherine Laboré, talking about forgiveness, says, One must learn to see God in everyone. One must learn to see God in everyone. So even though we might have a fallout, there can be healing and reconciliation. Doesn't mean you have to be the person's best bud. Any psychologist, psychiatrist would tell you boundaries are good in certain situations. 
let's say it was a perpetrator of a crime against you, okay? But you need to forgive that person. You don't need to be their best bud, but you need to forgive that person. Maybe it's not a crime committed against you, but maybe it's a stalker. You don't need to be their best bud, but you need to forgive the person, okay? Maybe it was a fallout with someone who was very utilitarian towards you, and you sense that. You don't need to be their best bud, but you need to forgive them. It's very, very important, the healing effects of forgiveness. When one does not forgive, there's devastating effects of non-forgiveness. Experience demonstrates that the effects of an unwillingness to forgive are so devastating that they can make life tortuous for a person. We can see this at the end of the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18. Quote, then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you besought me to, and should not you have also had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? Yet you did not. In, and then in anger, his Lord delivered him to his jailers till he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Forgiveness, on the other hand, makes our lives miraculous and full of grace. By choosing to forgive, we choose a life of mercy and grace that God has made for us, rather than a life of deprivation and torture. The book of Sirach from the Old Testament, chapter 28, verse 2 says, Forgive your neighbor the wrong he has done, and then your sins will be pardoned when you pray. And St. Paul wrote, none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. We are the Lord's. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Now, knowing that truth, that we are the Lord's, we want to treat others as the Lord would treat them. We want to treat others as we want them to treat us. The Lord himself wants us to receive and practice mercy, love, and forgiveness precisely because he himself gave us mercy, love, and forgiveness, especially through the Paschal mystery, his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. The Lord himself wants us to receive and practice mercy, love, and forgiveness. From these, we receive life in Christ. Without, without them, we are separated from him. Yet the devil, who is real, would like nothing more than to tempt us not to forgive. And while such temptations can be strong to not forgive, we need to turn to God willfully, intellectually, seeking to do his will to forgive and hold strong in forgiveness until the temptation to not forgive passes. Something great to confess. Even though you, you didn't yet cross the threshold where you said, I'm not gonna forgive the person, in fact, you're fighting the temptation, but it happens to be the time to make your monthly confession, Tell the confessor that. Say, Father, in this last month, since my last confession, I was greatly, greatly tempted to not forgive a person. I never gave into it, but I still want to confess the strength of the, of the temptation in confession, Father, precisely to break the bond of it, because it's still lingering. See, you can confess something that indeed you never gave into, but was a very strong temptation for you because mentioning it in confession as such, make it clear to the confessor, you never fell into it. But, and mentioning it to the confessor as such in the sacrament helps break the bond of it. I never gave into it, Father, but it was strong and it, it, it's still lasting. It started about four days ago and it's still there. And I asked God to break the bond of it and I, that's why I'm mentioning it in confession. The devil hates that. Uh, there's a great quote from St. Philip Neri. I mentioned it on Open Line Tuesday the other day on radio. Uh, he says, when you go to confession, mention the most hideous, wicked, mortal sins up front, if there are some there. Why? Because it throws the devil in absolute confusion about that confession. See, the devil thinks you're going to hide it from the confessor. He hates it when you're honest in your confession calling it what it is according to kind and approximate number. No need for a lot of great or graphic detail, just kind and approximate number for mortal sin and any militating circumstance that makes the already mortal sin objectively more grave. That's a third element that we mentioned, if it changes the species of the mortal sin, but never 
greater graphic detail. Just call it what it is and give the approximate number of times. And if it's a mortal sin, hideous and wicked, mention it up front, St. Philip Neri says, because it throws the devil in absolute confusion. Isn't that great? And he was known to be very happy-go-lucky and sanguine in temperament. It's a great quote. Forgive, heal, and don't equate forgiveness and healing of that forgiveness with needing to be the person's best bud. That's not what that means. That's not what forgiveness and healing means. Forgiveness and healing means just that, forgiving the person. And again, in some cases, boundaries are good. They need to be in place for a, a variety of reasons, utilitarianism, the, the crime that was perpetuated against you by the person, whatever. So don't equate forgiveness and healing with needing to be the person's best bud. That's not what St. Thomas Aquinas means. It's great if the healing can get to that level, but it doesn't have to. But we forgive from the heart. Amen? Amen. And let us always look to St. Joseph and St. Maria Goretti as our guides in this regard. God bless you.